Good morning. Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. So glad you're able to be here today and just have several announcements and some prayer needs that we want to bring to you this morning. Ask that you would remember. I um, want to mention to you guys that on Sunday the 29th, that's the last Sunday this month, that's also a Sunday that we celebrate um, Memorial Day weekend. We're going to be having, after service that morning, we're going to be having a crawfish ball here. Now there will also be some other things for those that don't do crawfish, but here's the, here's the deal on this. Um, the crawfish bowl is uh, used as an opportunity for you to bring somebody. If you bring somebody who doesn't attend church with you to that crawfish bowl, you get your plate free. Okay? So if you bring somebody that doesn't attend church with you to the crawfish bowl, you get to get yours and theirs free. Okay? If you don't, you pay for yours. It's $10 a person. We want to do this as an opportunity to get people in. If you don't want crawfish, we'll probably have some hamburgers or hot dogs. For, for those who don't eat crawfish. If you've never tried them and you'd like to try them, hey, um, what are you out if you try them one time, right? Um, it, it's it, it's going to be something interesting, something different. Let me tell you, they had a crawfish bowl at the Chamber of Commerce um, this week. Um, they charge 12 bucks for each person to come and do that um, at the Chamber of Commerce. And they have a great old time with it. So if, if we can have, you're going to get to do it for less. And if you bring somebody that's not in church, that, that doesn't attend church with you, then you get to have yours and theirs free. And so it's an opportunity for you to do something for them and, and for to share the gospel with somebody. And so we just, we, again, that's actually two weeks from today. And so we want your, we want your help with that. And, um, and if you're really going to do that, would you let us know ahead of time? Uh, we've already ordered the amount of crawfish, um, but let us know ahead of time um, because we, we certainly uh, would appreciate that. And we, again, we want you all to be able to be a part of that. And, and if you've never done it, try something you've never done. Okay? Try something you've never done. Um, you never know. You may enjoy it. This evening at 6 o'clock, we're going to be having service this evening with Faith Temple House of Prayer, which is on the corner of Rose and McCaney. Uh, many of you have been there before. We've ministered there before. They had a Holy Week service there, Pastor Willie Williams. Um, we want you to come be a part of that. They're in revival today, and they invited us to be with them on this Sunday evening at 6 o'clock at Faith Temple. And so um, we would love you to come and be an evening service. and. Um, again, if you know Brother Williams, you know how, what a wonderful, tremendous guy, man of God he is. And their church is just wonderful people. But they love fellowshipping with you guys. And then next Sunday evening, all right, next Sunday evening, we're going to be having a movie night here at the church where we're going to be showing the movie Breakthrough. And it'll be a wonderful time as fellowship. Um, get to have popcorn and some things like that with it. So we're going to do that next Sunday evening. So we've got some things uh, coming up that we want you to be able to be a part of. And then uh, I believe the, um, the Delancey family asked that I would uh, share this invitation with you if you want to come to it. Next Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall, they're going to be having a graduation um, party for Caleb Allen. Um, Caleb's graduating. And then next Sunday during service, we're going to celebrate our graduates. We have... Um, a graduate from the church that we're going to be celebrating next Sunday and so um, you get that opportunity to do that. We have some prayer needs that we want you to remember. Um, I ask you to remember a little six-year-old boy named Jax who's going to have to have um, surgery, major surgery on his skull um, here in the upcoming days. Continue to remember Abigail Grace, a little five-year-old girl that we've been mentioning in prayer who, who um, has cancer in her leg and She's from uh, the, the Little Rock area, or from Stuttgart. So remember little Abigail Grace, and she is undergoing treatment right now for that very serious situation. Uh, remember Brother Frankie in prayer tomorrow. Brother Frankie has to have surgery, and um, so to have a hernia repaired. And so remember him in prayer. And um, remember him in prayer that the surgery goes well, but also remember him in prayer um, that he does what the doctors tell him afterwards. Um, sometimes Brother Frankie needs to be reminded to do what the doctors tell you, you know. Um, and so, um, as some others need to, need to do as well. And Brother Harold, continue to remember Brother Harold in prayer. 
Um, it's still just up and down for him, but remember him in prayer. And then um, we also ask, um, we're just remind you to let you know, Brother Billy West is doing um, very well. He just can't drive right now. And he wanted to come to church today, um, but they told him no. Um, because he, he's still just a week, a little over a week out from this surgery, but um, he is doing well. Continue to in prayer. Well, I ask you to stand to your feet. How many of you are ready to be in church, have worship the Lord? I'm ready to worship the Lord this morning. And, um, and I didn't get to be here um, last Sunday because I was out of town. But it, and, and, I, and I, 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 I got word. We got to watch the whole service. But I've got to say this. It is so good that I get to see Brother Billy Walls in church. Uh, what a tremendous blessing that is. He has been through such, a, such an ordeal, but uh, man, isn't God good? Isn't God good? And, and He's so good to us. God, we love You and we thank You, dear Lord, for the opportunities that we have to come into Your house to worship and to magnify You and to glorify You, dear God. Lord, we ask You in the name of Jesus, dear Lord, to touch and minister, dear God, to each one of us today, dear Lord. We pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit would speak to us, dear Lord, and that you would help us, dear God, today. God, we know, dear Lord, that you have a plan for us, that you have a plan for each of us. And God, I pray, dear Lord, that we would see that plan um, take place in our lives, see it come to fruition. God, I pray for the needs of the people. We pray for this little six-year-old boy that's having surgery, dear God, that you will touch him, dear Lord, on this skull surgery. God, we pray for Abigail Grace, dear God, that you touch that little child with cancer, dear God, and give her healing and recovery. God, we pray that you would touch, dear God, Brother Frankie in his surgery, dear God. Lord, that everything would go well and, and he would recover quickly. Lord, for Brother Harold, dear God, we just still pray that you touch his body and that you minister to him, dear God. Lord, we pray, dear God, that you touch, Lord, and continue to minister to Brother, Brother Billy West, dear God. And we thank you, dear God, for your hand of being on us, dear God. And we thank you, dear God, that you hear our prayers, dear God, and that we call unto you, dear God, and you will answer us. God, we love you today, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Right now, why don't you just lift up your hands? Why don't you just welcome the Lord? And would you honor him today? Let's worship him.
We want God to open up this floodgates in our lives. We want Him to show us His glory, and I know that He will. We're going to get ready. We're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and with our offerings. Isn't it good to be able to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord? It's a, it is a tremendous blessing to be able to do this. So this morning, I want you just to think about how much God has blessed you as you get a chance to bless Him with your giving this morning. Are you ready to bless the Lord? I, are you ready to bless the Lord? God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to bring our tithes to you and our offerings, dear God. Lord, as we bring these to you today, dear God, we ask, dear Lord, that you would bless it, dear God. Bless the givers, dear Lord. God, we know, dear Lord, that you're going to bless them today. In Jesus' name. Worship the Lord with your gifts right now.
your victory. That's your victory that you're going to have. And I thank God for that. Just lift up your hands and won't you give him thanks for victories in your life. Victories that you've had, but I want you to go ahead and thank him for victories that you've not yet had. For the victory that's coming. For the victory that's going to take place in your situation and your circumstances. Because I promise you this, if you'll serve God, if you'll honor him, if you'll live for him, your victory's on the way. It may be difficult, it may be challenging now, but God has your victory and you're gonna see it take place in your life. God, we love you, we thank you, dear God, for the victories, dear God, not the ones that we've already had, but the ones that are on the way. We thank you for our victory, dear God, for the circumstance that we're facing today, that that victory is on the way. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys so much. They do such a tremendous job. And, you know, we we got to be in service with you last week, but we had to do it in a Wendy's in an airport in Houston, Texas. But, but it's nothing like being here with you. All right? I love Facebook Live. I thank God that we have Facebook Live available, but it's nothing like being here with you in person. And we're so glad that we can be here together with this church family that we so dearly love. You know, I saw something this morning that a month ago we weren't sure that we would see. And when I saw it, I, had, I wanted to make sure that it would get done right. I saw Michael Allen driving in the church. He hadn't driven since December of, of last year because of his surgery that he had. And as he was driving up to the parking spot, I said, Dear God, please let him be able to use the brakes. <laughs> and he can use the brakes. So that's, uh, and that, uh, that's another comeback right there. That's another comeback. <laughs> now he's wanting his keys back, but I'm just saying about the comeback. I'm not getting into the keys back issue. That's between him and, and his family. But he could use the brake today. And I saw his grandma was in the, in the car with him and, and she had her eyes closed and gripped. She was praying, please God, let him be able to use that brake. And I was thanking God too because he was coming toward the wall of the church and he did not hit it. Good job, Mike. Good job. He'll get those keys back eventually. Today, as we continue talking about our setbacks or our comebacks, and I don't really want to talk about our setbacks as much as our comebacks, but we have to see the setback. I'm going to talk about this morning when your setback feels like a failure. And that's really a truth that we're, all of us get when we have a setback at some point in time. Our setbacks will sometimes make us feel like a failure. I'm going to read you scripture. This is one of the encouraging scriptures that I read, and most of you know it by heart. I'm reading it from a different translation, so don't, don't freak out because I'm not reading this from the King James. It, just, it, it says something a little different, or it says it in a different way. And it, it reads in a different way. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to His name. 
Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you're close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. But I want you to take notice of this next part here. Where it says, Surely, goodness and unfailing love pursue me all the days of my life. Now, I want you to understand where it says that, that lets us know that we'll have a comeback. That lets us know no matter what our service is, if we serve God, Sister Wanda, we're going to have a comeback. And he says, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. God, I ask that you add your blessing to this word today. As we come to you, as you speak to us, dear God, that you would minister to us. Thank you, Lord. And we ask for your anointing. Sometimes the setbacks that we have make us feel like a failure. We all go through these things in our lives. And I know for me, as a pastor, as a parent, and as a son, there are certain things that I've dealt with that were setbacks that make me feel like a failure. Sometimes decisions that you have to make will make you feel like, did I make the right decision? I want to go back a little bit in time for my family. And I'll go back just a few years. In 2013, my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It wasn't something that we wanted to hear about. It was like, for me, it was something in denial. I looked at him, my, my dad doesn't have Alzheimer's. And there's no way he has Alzheimer's. Now, my grandmother... His mother passed away. She had Alzheimer's and passed away in 2002. And just 11 short years later, we get this diagnosis that my dad has Alzheimer's. All the doctors, they don't know what they're talking about. I wanted to, in fact, I tried to get dad. Dad, don't retire. Keep working. Keep staying at the, at the plant. Keep, 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 keep selling cars because I know that, 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 that that's what you need to do. And, 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 and he, he, did, he began manifesting things that, that we didn't know and didn't understand. But... I mean, at that time, my dad was what you call pleasantly confused. He was, he was funny. In fact, it would get to the place that, you know, because uh, of confusion, mom, you know, sometimes dad wouldn't go to church. And then on Sunday morning, I'd come to the pulpit and I'd see my phone would begin to ring at 1130. And it was my dad calling. Well, I couldn't answer it, Brother Roger, because I was preaching. And I couldn't answer the phone, so I'd hit I'd hit that, but I'd hit the decline on the phone call, I'm declining my dad's call. Now I get it. My kids decline my calls all the time. All right, I, I, I've never called my kids and they'll answer right off the bat. I don't know if any of you ever had that issue with your children, but and, and, and so I was declining my dad's call. I mean, I'd call him after church. As soon as church was over, I'd call him and say, "Dad, you know, you called him while I was preaching." He said, "So he didn't care. He didn't care. If you knew my dad before he had Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's." He was still in charge of everything. And so, as Dad's disease began to progress, we began seeing things. And then, in 2018, my mom had to have open heart surgery. My mom had open heart surgery. Dad had to be away from her. She had to be away from him for three weeks. And then things really changed. He was pleasantly confused up to that point. And so then we started having to take turns. Dad could not stay by himself. We had to take turns watched him and, and, and me and my brothers would take turns and my dad would see things. He, he would see bears in the house at night. He would be very confused about things and, 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 and he would get confused about different things. And One day on a Wednesday, I, I, was, I had dad and my brother was at his work and I had dad. I had him up at the office with me. And that wasn't fair to a man with Alzheimer's to have him at the church office. I didn't have any choice. And, Mom was in the hospital and dad was at the church office with me and it didn't take long, you know, for him to get bored with his circumstances. So I'd walk him over to the house and sit him down and, and then he began to say, I want to go home. I said, Dad, you can't go home. It's Wednesday. Wednesday's a very busy day for me and I, I can't take you home. And he said, I want to go home. And I mean, he, he just gets belligerent about it. I said, Dad, you can't go home. I said, I said, when Richie gets off work, he'll take you wherever. I said, but you can't go home because you can't stay by yourself. Now, up to that point, 
When my dad would walk places, if he would walk from the car into our house, he would walk like this. Took him forever. That was frustrating too. Uh, Dad, can't you pick up those feet? Yeah, I wanted to be a drill sergeant. It's like, Dad, march. And he would just walk like that. Walk so slow, I would get aggravated with him. And so I thought, well, surely, you know, I can leave him for a minute because, I mean, he's slow. He can't even get to the door in five minutes. So I came over to the office just to look at something for five minutes. And, um, and, and I had to get something. And I went back over to the house and went in the living room. And he's gone. So I go and so I check the rooms in the house. I go check everything. I go outside and I look. And he's not walking like this. My dad is scooting down Little Road. I mean, he is walking just as fast as he could down Little Road. And he's heading toward his house. Now, my dad lives way, or my parents lived way out on Highway 312 between Dell and Burnett. And he's walking, he's heading toward that overpass. And, and so I, I take off and, and I'm running down Rural road, road and I catch up to my dad. And I run up to him and I said, Dad, what are you doing? He looked at me and said, I'm going home. And I said, you can't go home. And I started grabbing him, he reared his hand back at me like he was going to punch me. I said, whoa. First of all, even with Alzheimer's, my dad was still stronger than me. And Bubba, I didn't want to get punched by him because I'd have went down like a, like a, like a bag of potatoes. But um, I said, Dad, I'll take you home. I'll take you home. My boy said, he said, do you promise? I said, yes, I'll take you home. And then um, I walked him back to the, as we were walking back to the house, my brother pulled up and I said, thank God. I said, he's yours. I've had him all day. And so, my brother takes him. I said, you don't have to take him home. He's not going to go to your house. He said, I don't. So he carries him home. A few months later, we had to put Dad in a nursing home. And then I, I look back at that, and some of that's funny. But after, putting, after seeing what my dad went through in, in his mind, the things that he worried about in himself, I look back and I, there's so many things and those setbacks that we had and I said, boy, I feel like I failed my dad. And I felt like a failure so many times. What could I have done to, to, to keep things like that? Running? What could I have done to make him feel more comfortable? What could I have done um, to, 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 to help him and my mom out? And so many times I felt like a failure. And we do that in different things. There was a setback that I really felt like a failure because... You know, my dad, I had failed him. And even at times where my dad had to go into, in, into special care, that, that, that I said, what could we have done differently? And you felt like a failure. And then everybody has different circumstances, different things that they're facing. That when it doesn't go the way that you plan, you feel like you've failed and that you're a failure. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. You know, there's some things that will help you through this and I believe I have for you this morning that can help you not to see yourself as a failure. And these are the things that I want to give you this morning. One is this. God is in control no matter how things appear. That is a key truth that we need to understand. No matter how things appear in your life, I want you to understand that God is in control. He said, that's a key. When I read this 23rd Psalm, I realize that God is in control. You know, what's really interesting, I've discovered that there's really, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. My dad wasn't the first person to have this some ter terrible disease, and he's not going to be the last person to have it. Your circumstance that you're dealing with, even though it's probably different my brothers, but you're not the first person to go through a wayward child or a difficult circumstance with your finances or, or surgery or something like that or, or even a mistake that, that you've made at your job or even a, even a moral failure. You're not the first person to do that. There's nothing new under the sun. And we need to realize that any place that you've been, any emotion you've ever had, any thought you've ever had, somebody's been there before. Somebody's had that before. I discovered I wasn't the only person to pray, God, I don't understand 
what's going on with these circumstances. When I didn't understand what was going on with my dad, there were many times I didn't know what to pray. I didn't know how to pray. And I'm not the only person to do that. There were times that, 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 that I've had things that I prayed that God, man, I, I wish you would take me out of this because I can't make these decisions anymore. And we even find Old Testament evidence of that. There's a guy in the Old Testament who would pray those way, those wayward prayers. And, and he's a guy that you wouldn't think he would pray things like that. He wouldn't pray these prayers that, that, that are depressing. You know, that, did you know not every prayer in the Bible is uplifting? There's some prayers in the Bible that are depressing. Because you know what? Every person that prayed in the Bible was human. Have you ever prayed a prayer that the next day you thought, I shouldn't have prayed that? There's a guy in the Bible we're going to talk about this morning who did. His name's Elijah. You know, the psalmist said this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'll ask this question. Have any of you ever felt let down by God? I have. You know, sometimes we're afraid to face our feelings as if God is a God that can't take our feelings. That, that when things aren't going their way and, 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 and that we feel let down by God, that we're afraid to say it. I know Michael Allen going through this recovery a lot longer. There have been times Missy's felt let down by God because we thought he'd be better in a month. And it hadn't worked out that way. But guess what? We can have those feelings. You have a God who's big enough to take those feelings. I'm glad we serve the one Jehovah Jireh who can take, who can take our depressing prayers and he can take those things most of us know the story of Elijah. You know, we, we like the story of Elijah. You know, the favorite part of the story of Elijah to most of us is, 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 is that Elijah walked in the power of God and he called down the power of God and overcame 850 false prophets. Boy, isn't that exciting. That's a great story, right? I mean, he saw great things happen. I mean... I mean, Elijah prays a beautiful 63-word prayer and fire falls down from heaven. And then they slay 850 false prophets. What great things. But it's after that Mount Carmel meltdown, this is what happened. After the fires called down from heaven, this is what happened with Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel, everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. Now Elijah just killed all these prophets of Jezebel like. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. You know, every one of us have a Jezebel in our life that wants to take our victory and rob us from it. Elijah had just called down fire from heaven. He had just had this great victory, had just slayed 850 false prophets, and then Elijah is inundated that very day with fear for his own life. I mean, Elijah was afraid for his life just hours after he had spoke words to God and God showed up. And Elijah walks in fear. Just because, hear me say, just because you serve God doesn't mean you're going to have an absence of fear in every circumstance. There's going to be some things that just overwhelm you. Sometimes you get a miracle and the next day you have a disaster. You go on. In 1 Kings 19, he says this, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he may die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I'm no better than my ancestors who have already died. Isn't this amazing? 
I mean, it's amazing. Within one day, he saw God's miraculous thing. And now, he's so depressed, so discouraged, so confused, so afraid that he's saying, God, just take my life. I'm done. You see, being a Christian doesn't keep you from having feelings. Being a Christian doesn't keep you from always, um, for, or doesn't keep you from ever being depressed or anxious. I, I think we, we, we've made some terrible mistakes in how we present this. We tell people, you know what, because you're saved, you can never go through depression. We'll find that in the Word of God. Because you're saved, you'll never have to, have to, have to, have to, have to take care of your own mental health. You can't find that in the Word of God. Elijah had to do it. Elijah loved God. Elijah served God. And he was having issues right here that brought fear in his life. It's interesting. He left his servant in Beersheba and he went on alone. You know, what happens is sometimes when we're going through things like this, we say, you know what, I'd rather be alone. And that's not good for us. Well, if I can encourage you, when you're going through a difficult time, when you're going through a setback, don't go it alone. Don't do it by yourself. That's a mistake. We're stronger when we're with others. We're stronger when we're together. Elijah didn't have his servant with him. Elijah didn't have servants because he was wealthy. He had servants because he was a prophet of God. And this servant was there to serve the prophet of God and Elijah turned these and turned him away. We can't do that. It's, that, it's what he was saying. Elijah was saying, I'm done. I'm out of ministry. This doesn't make sense to me anymore. I've just had this great victory. Now I'm about to lose my life. I, it doesn't make sense. And sometimes things don't make sense. Dr. James Dobson wrote a book many years ago, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. This is when you have to understand this. When you're going through that time, where it seems like it has all broken loose on you, and it's a setback of incredible disorder in your life, this is when you have to understand, my friends, that God is in control no matter how things appear. He's in control no matter how things appear. But the second thing that we find is this. God is with you even when you can't see His plan. You see, God's not only in control, but God is with us even when we can't see it. And that's a great thing for us to understand. Elijah, in 1 Kings 19, he goes on and says this, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, Get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate, drank, and lay down. To me, this is pretty awesome. I want to ask you this question. If God intended for Elijah to die, why give him the last meal? Why cook him a meal? You see, what God was doing is he was introducing himself to him and said, look, I'm the same God. I know I was an angel here. But when you see angels interact with people in circumstances like this, it's essentially the very presence of God that's interacting with them. And that's what was happening to Elijah here. Elijah wasn't interacting with an angel. God had came and prepared a meal for Elijah. Remember what the 23rd Psalm says? That He sets a meal before us. That He'll feed us in the presence of our enemies. I mean, that's pretty amazing to me. I mean, Elijah had seen God do the spectacular, the miraculous. Now, he's through with ministry. And so what does God do for him? Here's what God does for him. God doesn't come to him and do this. As this is the human nature to come up to somebody. Oh, I'm on, Michael Allen, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Everyone's like, well, what, what's wrong with you? Why are you feeling this way about yourself? You're a failure. That's not what God does. God doesn't do that. God didn't say, what's wrong with you, Elijah? Why are you here? You're a failure, Elijah. What kind of prophet are you? God makes him dinner. Some of you need to know today that God is there to make you your dinner. Folks, I'm not talking about going to the Grecian. 
I'm not talking about going to the fish house. I'm talking about you being able to eat in the presence of the Lord. In the most difficult times of your life, God will prepare your food. What does that mean? God knows what we need when we need it. That to me is so awesome. God doesn't, you know, when I look here and I see that God makes this meal for Elijah, you know what I see? I see God making a home-cooked meal for Elijah with no judgment. Why do you want to die, Elijah? Why do you feel like a failure, Elijah? No. Just here. I love you. I want to fix you. You know, what is the old saying? What's the best way to a man's heart? Through his stomach, right? I mean, people can tell you they love you all day long. But you know they love you when they'll cook for you, right? Come on. How many of you love it when somebody cooks for you? When they cook your favorite meal? When they cook what you need? You know what Elijah did? He ate. He drank. And he went out and took another nap. You see, how does God respond when we've given up? It says, Then the angel of the Lord came again, touched him and said, Get up and eat some more. Or the journey ahead will be too much for you. The angel of the Lord knew what Elijah was going to do. The angel of the Lord knew the journey that Elijah was going on. And he says, You haven't ate enough. You need to eat some more. You need to, you need to have some more. You see, when we've given up on ourselves, instead of God giving us judgment, God will come and give you a touch. He'll give you a meal, and He'll give you some rest. That's why I know that God is with me, even when I don't know the plan. Sometimes we can be so hard on ourselves with the setbacks in life. Sometimes you can be so hard on yourself and say, you know what, I, I have made so many bad mistakes. Well, let me just to be honest with you, everybody's made mistakes. Everybody's done the wrong thing. Everybody's made the wrong decision. You're not going to be... Listen, I want to tell somebody. I want somebody to understand this. You're not going to be the perfect wife. You're not going to be the perfect husband. You're not going to be the perfect child. You're not going to be the perfect parent. You're not going to be the perfect sibling. None of us are going to be... You're going to let some people down. You're going to feel let down yourself. You're going to have setbacks. But I've come to tell you this morning that you don't have to feel like you're a failure just because you're going through this setback today. Don't walk in that. Don't believe that. Know that God understands what you're going through. He knows what you're dealing with. And He can help you through it. And even though you're hard on yourself, God has not come to judge you. God has come to love you. Somebody ought to say amen. In Psalm 136, every single verse ends this way. His mercy endures forever. You know what God understands about you? I know you say everything, but just bear with me for a second. God understands that we're human. God understands that you're human. Just do this real quick. Just entertain me, okay? Tap yourself on the chest. Go ahead. It ain't going to hurt you. If it hurts you, I'm sorry. Now say, I'm human. Now look at your neighbor and say, you're just human. Look at your neighbor and say, I know you're not perfect. I'm going to ask you to declare it to yourself. You're declaring it to that person next to you. Tell your spouse, I know you're not perfect. Tell your child, I know you're not perfect. Tell your friend, I know you're not perfect. Because we're all human. It's not so bad. It's not so bad being human. Don't be so hard on yourself. You know what grace is the concept for us, not our animals. God made grace for people. He made grace for you. It's okay to be human. The third thing, when you think it's all over, 
with God. It's just beginning. Sometimes we think it's over. But with God, it's just beginning. Look at verse 9 in 1 Kings 19. He says, But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? I want to take you to another mountain. Now, you know, Elijah was, had been at Mount Carmel. But I want to take you to another mountain. In Luke's Gospel... The old Dr. Luke tells us about the experience that he had. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 31, it says, About eight days later, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was transformed, transfigured. And his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, two men, Moses and who? Elijah appeared and began talking with him or talking with Jesus. To me, the reason that that's amazing is after the angel had fed Elijah, he had headed straight to the mountain we call Mount Sinai. See, he had been at Mount Carmel. He heads to Mount Sinai. Now, where is Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is the place where Moses met with God and he hides himself in the cleft of the rock. He asked God for His presence. God talks to Elijah and He asks him a question. Elijah, where are you? What are you doing here? When God asks the question, it's not because He doesn't know the answer. It's not like He's saying, Hey, Elijah, I didn't think I'd see you here. No, when God asks the question, He's looking to us at the question or wanting us to look at the question. What are you doing here? God asks Elijah to come to the entrance of the cave, but Elijah doesn't. God wants Elijah to come and get out of the cave, but Elijah doesn't want to do that. Elijah's now in the cave. And then what happened while Elijah's in the cave? You know the story. Elijah's in the cave and you have a windstorm, and it tore the rocks loose. But what do we find out about the windstorm? God wasn't in the windstorm. Elijah was in the cave and there was an earthquake and it literally shook under his feet. But what did we find out? God wasn't in the earthquake, was He? Elijah was in the cave and then there was a sound. Some translations call it what? A still, small voice. Some translations call it a gentle whisper. You see, here's what I found out is Sometimes we have windstorms in our life and God's not in that. Sometimes we have earthquakes in our lives and God's not in it. But God's always going to be around that small, still, gentle voice speaking in our ears. Because it lets me know this. It reminds me this. That when I think it's all over, God is still with me. It wasn't until God heard the voice, or until Elijah heard the voice of God, that he stepped out of the cave. To see what God told Elijah. You know what God told Elijah? Elijah's like in this cave by himself. I'm the only prophet. I'm the only one. They want to kill me. They want to destroy me. I'm the only prophet. I, I, you know, I've made a mistake killing these 850 prophets of Baal and prophets of the other gods and Asherah. And I, I, I've made the mistake. But then God speaks to me and He says, hey, Elijah, I want you to know this. You're not by yourself. What did he tell him? He said, there are 7,000 people who've not bowed the knee. Boy, isn't that something for you to know that you're not by yourself? You've had setbacks, but you're not by yourself. But you reckon that some of those 7,000 people have had setbacks in their life too? Those 7,000 people who served God, who honored God, they've had setbacks in their life. Elijah wasn't the only one that had setbacks. They had had setbacks as well. And so God wanted him to know, you're not alone. I've come to tell some of you today, you're not by yourself in your circumstances. And no, misery doesn't love company. When we're in misery, our company helps to strengthen us. And I want you to understand this. 
that it's not over. It's just beginning for you. That God has a plan for your life. You know, what happened was, we don't always know the plan. You don't have to know the plan. But God's in control. And here's what I think is kind of neat. Now I go back to the part where Elijah and Moses meet with Jesus. Now we know the story. Elijah gets taken up in a whirlwind later on. He, he doesn't die physically in the flesh. But it was many hundreds of years later before Elijah finally met the rock. You see, Elijah was where he was on Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where, where, uh, where, where God had put Moses in the cleft of the rock. And then Elijah, after he's taken away, he meets the rock. Who's the rock? The rock is Jesus. I mean, we have that old song, Elijah finally comes face to face with the rock. And I want to tell you that some of you are today in your circumstances going to come face to face with the rock. But the old song says, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin, the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Has any of you met the rock before? And I'll know this, it goes on in that song, it says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I the fountain fly, wash me Savior, or I die. Can I tell you this this morning? Is that even though you felt like a failure in your setback, I've come to tell you because you've met the rock, you're not a failure. Nobody who's met Jesus Christ is a failure. I've failed plenty of times in my life. I've failed plenty of times since I've been saved. But I'm not a failure. No, I didn't fail my dad. No, I didn't fail my mom. I didn't fail them. It was the circumstances were the circumstances. No, I went through a setback. But I've come to tell you that I know that God's a God of comebacks. You see, I had to go through to times of, of, of thinking generational things because my grandma had Alzheimer's, because my dad had Alzheimer's. I started getting paranoid that I'm going to get Alzheimer's because it must be something in my family. And maybe there's something I can do about it, but here's the reality of this. I started this, I'm not going to walk in that setback any longer. And you know what, I can't control what's going to happen in many circumstances in my health, but what I can control is how I live from this day on, and I'm not going to live worried about things that I can't control. I'm going to live a life of a comeback. I'm not going to worry. I'm not going to be in doubt. I'm not going to be in fear because I know that I know the rock who is Jesus Christ, who has saved my soul, who has set me free. I'm going to be all right. And I can promise you this, you're going to be all right. You're not a failure. Come to music, please. I just want to tell everybody in this place, I want you to, everybody to be able to testify and understand you're not a failure. We can be hard on ourselves and we can be hard on each other, but you're not a failure. You're not a failure. It may not have happened the way you wanted to. Your circumstances may not be going the direction that you planned, but you're not a failure. You've got the rock. You've got Jesus Christ with you. You don't have to feel these ways anymore. God is with you. God is for you. And He is not against you. I, I want to remind somebody of what the Word tells us in Romans chapter 8. He says, if God be for us, who can be against us? I don't think you heard me. 
If God be for us, who can be against us? I, I, I love what he tells us. What shall separate us from the love of God? And he says, shall tribulation and persecution, shall, shall, shall distress, shall nakedness, shall peril, shall sword. All these things. I mean, you know what he tells us is nay. Everybody say nay. nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. You're not a failure. You're not a failure just because you've had setbacks doesn't make you a failure. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. I want to ask you to shut your eyes. This morning I've come to encourage you. The great prophet of God, the great prophet Elijah, felt himself to be a failure. But God proved himself. Elijah wasn't a failure. He wasn't by himself either. It's a journey. Sure it is. You're going to be on journeys. That's okay. But you're not a failure. I want to ask you this right now. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're going through a circumstance in your life that's a setback and you just haven't, you haven't got the comfort in it. You haven't got the, the peace in that setback yet. Whatever it may be. It may be something in your family. It may be something in your health. It may be something in your spirit. It may be something in your finances. No matter what it may be, you've you got something going on in, 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 in a setback in your life. And look, I don't know why we get all weird about it when we have setbacks act like we're the only one you're not but you have this need and in this setback you feel like it you've messed up and you failed you feel like you just that you're not coming out of it you say pastor that's me I, 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 I've got this setback and it just I've not got peace over it right now hold your hand up nobody look around hold your hand up 